Good morning. Good morning, my DLD friends, and welcome to our first DLD Sync in 2021. I hope you and your family had a good start to the new year. Despite the pandemic situation, which still has a firm grip on us. This leads us directly into our session today. Of course, you know, we live in a complex in complex times of transformation and geopolitical shifts. The pandemic accelerates this complexity even further. Every day we see a multitude of news in abundance. Some of them are very well balanced, some of them are highly opinionated, and some are pure speculation. What we need, however, is trustworthy information that helps us understand issues properly and allows learning about and dealing with the current crises. And we need an open, respectful debate about the rights and wrongs, which focuses on long-term outlooks and solutions. That's why I'm proud to offer you an interesting debate today with two outspoken journalists who have co-authored a very good book here called The Wake-Up Call. The Wake-Up Call, why the pandemic has exposed the weakness of the West and how to fix it, which is also the title of our session. Both are joined by a well-versed business leader who now brings his expertise into the field of foreign relations. Please, my friend, welcome John Micklethwaite, Editor-in-Chief at Bloomberg, Adrian Woolbridge, Political Editor at The Economist, and Tom Enders, my friend, and President of the German Council on Foreign Relations and former CEO of um, um, Airbus and EADS. Friends, the floor is yours. Tom, would you like to start? Thank you, Thank you very Thank much, you. Steffi. Uh, I'm afraid to say I missed most of your introduction because of <coughs> technical problems. Uh, can, can you all hear me now, John and Adrian? Yes. yes. Great. Yes. Well, thanks, Steffi. And uh, thank you very much, John and Adrian, for taking the time for this, uh, for this online chat here on geopolitics in pandemic times or in, the, in, in, in COVID times. Uh, John and Adrian, I mean, you wrote a book in record, record time. Um, maybe we can start by, by asking you, John, why did you write this book and give us perhaps a, for those of our viewers who haven't read it yet, I think there are only a few probably, uh, a, a brief uh, summary of the, of the content. Well, thank, thank you, Tom, and thank you. I did hear Stephanie, and thank, thank you for the nice words. She was polite about you too, Tom. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Good to hear. <laughs> thank, you to, thank you. Thank you both. I mean, basically, we wrote the Wake Up Call because we wrote it in the early summer last year because it became rapidly apparent to us that two really big things were happening, which I think you could argue now uh, have, have become even more true. And the first was that government matters. Suddenly, government, which, you know, we, we both come from the private sector. We both used to work at The Economist. I'm now at Bloomberg. But we were used to heralding that side of the, of the, of the, of the world. But government suddenly made the difference between living or dying. And good government meant that you could survive COVID. Bad government gave you a very poor chance. And the easiest way to see that is if you look at the numbers for the death uh, per, per million people. And you, the, the numbers now are, uh, I just looked this morning, and they're, they're far more dramatic than when we wrote the book. If you look at Britain, very sadly, where I am, we're up around 1,300 deaths for every million people. You look across at the US, and it's 1,200 deaths. By contrast, in Germany, we're down around five, nearly 600 deaths, so twice as good. You look at places like New Zealand, Taiwan, Hong Kong, they're down around 20, 30 deaths per million. So 40, 50 times better. And many of the East Asian countries in particular did really well. And that brings me to our second point, is that if you look at the number for China, China claims a number of three deaths per million. Now, we all know that China played a somewhat strange role in the beginnings of the disease, and people aren't sure about that. 
and there's the issue about vaccines now. And a lot of people won't necessarily believe the Chinese number. But so imagine you take the three deaths per million and you multiply it by 10. <coughs> I think even I probably more journalists in China than anybody else. I don't think we quite believe it would be that bad. But imagine it rises to 30 deaths per million. Well, that is still 40, 50 times better. I look today nearly 50 times better than the United States. And the reason why that interested us, because that said to us, look, what we've been seeing over the past 25 years was Asia, particularly Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong, all these places getting much better at government. Well, you know, what, is, what has happened is not a fluke. They're the same places which finish top of education leagues. They have the better healthcare systems. It's not surprising they do well. But China has begun to reemerge because you go back 600, 500 years ago, it was China which led the world. And the West became better than China by being good at government. Well, in the 1960s, you had the apogee of that. You had China, millions of people dying of starvation because of bad government, whilst America was dreaming of putting a man on the moon. Well, since then, if you look very gradually, government has got better in Asia and worse in the West. And so the reason why we wrote the Wake Up Call is to say we want the democracies of the world to win. We think they should win. But if they keep on neglecting government in the way they are, and which COVID has ruthlessly <clears throat> exposed, then the future of the world will be back in Asia. So it's a message to both Europe and America, and for that matter, also the democracies of, mm. of Asia. <clears throat> that is the reason why we wrote it. Mm. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, I find the wake-up call very optimistic. Uh, to, to start with a provocative question. I mean, how many wake-up calls did we have already <clears throat> in the West? Just take the, the last uh, 10, 12 uh, years, perhaps. The, the Lehman crisis, the Euro crisis, uh, Ukraine, uh, Syria, uh, all, kinds of, all kinds of crises. And always people have said, well, this should be the wake-up call to the West. We need to be better, etc. Why on earth do you think you both that uh, this time around this could really be a wake-up call, or isn't it too late? Um, isn't uh, hasn't China won already? Um, aren't we aren't we you know further deteriorating? Um, so I mean, appreciate you write a very optimistic book, but but aren't you too optimistic, the two of you? You're, you're the I, first I, I, person I, I, to accuse us of optimism. <laughs> I'll let Adrian. I'll let Adrian. <laughs> I, 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 Excellent Teutonic pessimism there. Um, you are the first person who's accused us of, of being too optimistic, but you're certainly actually, you're actually right and you reflect my own rather pessimistic view of the world that we have had uh, a succession of wake up calls and yeah. we have just hit the snooze button <clears throat> and gone back to sleep. And that seems to be in our decadent way, the, the, you know, our response to the world. But I think this may be different in, in two ways. Uh, one is that we have set a global test. This is, I think, the first really global test. Everybody's been set the same examination. You know, how well can you respond to this global pandemic? And we have seen very, very definite big differences of the sort that John just pointed to between um, the Western democracies on the one hand and um, Far Eastern countries. And very surprising results. You would imagine that America and Britain and continental European countries would come out fairly near to the top. You would imagine that poorer countries like Vietnam or um, newer sort of emerging powers such as South Korea um, and uh, Taiwan would not be at the top. And you see, we see a very, very big difference and a big difference, as John said, which is correlated with other differences. So I think that is a, that is a shock. And I think secondly, um, we see China emerging as um, a superpower. China has done better than the United States, dramatically better than the United States, dramatically better than, the, than Britain. And it's really impossible uh, to deny that. And we see that at a time when global tensions with China are growing, at a time when China's own behavior, as we see with the Uyghurs and as we see with Hong Kong, is getting worse. So I really do think that this will be the moment when we begin to focus on the fact that A, China is not a paper tiger, it's a very serious tiger, 
uh, and secondly that it's that it's it's really not you know it's not some a country that can be absorbed into the global trading system with great ease in the way that we used to think in the in the 90s and i do think the fact that this wake up call has come on the top of um a series of other wake up calls makes it a bit more likely that we're beginning to respond i think even in in britain um i do see that there is a a response people have been rather shocked at the poor performance of the government the government i think has been rather shocked at its own poor performance and we have begun to get better we're actually not doing badly uh, with the rollout of the vaccine so we are adjusting in real time to a problem that has that has been set to us but it's not something that's automatic we will not automatically um adjust to these problems we have to keep banging away on, on this drum we have to keep buying and publicizing copies of the wake up call um because um b- b- because we we need just to remind ourselves that this 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 was a a, a dramatic moment in 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 history um and one uh, you know we are confronted with uh, what is potentially the change in the balance of power in the world since the the, the early modern period and mm-hmm. europe and the united states the free world in general cannot rely on the world to to uh, it cannot rely on its its position at the t- top of the table anymore mm. well gentlemen um maybe we come back to china a little a little later the the book is not just a brilliant analysis but uh, you also offer i think it was 13 recommendations kind of an action plan by to be executed by your the figure you created uh, out of um, out of uh, Abraham Lincoln and uh, William Gladstone Bill Bill Lincoln you called it so is that is that primarily an, an action uh, for uh, action plan for the new administration for the Biden administration it's it's, well, it's appropriate that an alarm has gone off in a book called <laughs> Wake Up Call. <laughs> but yes, it is. I mean, it, it just just to. I mean, I I think it's an interesting moment at the moment because I think people are looking um, at Biden, and quite a lot of people, especially in America, possibly less in Europe, are thinking that he he is the answer. Um, it was an interesting, you know, publicizing this book in America. How many Americans? seem to think either that there wasn't a problem if they supported Trump or that the, the, the problem was Trump. But if you look at what's gone wrong with America, if you know what happened to America during COVID, it, you know, you can you can blame Trump for some part of it, but really not the, not the depth of it. And the problem with America was it has a health system that is set up to look after the old and the rich and a pandemic hits the poor. And so it's always bound to expose that. Or look at the problems to do with policing and racism. Again, Trump didn't help that very much. But the problems with um, problems with with that, I, I covered Rodney King riots in Los Angeles 30 years ago. Um, the problems with the schools are also endemic. So they go much deeper than Biden. I think the reason why we invented this fictional president was partly because it was quite difficult to come up with one from real life. We have, I should say, been um, upbraided by by some people saying that we should have chosen a mixture out of Jacinda Ahern of New Zealand <laughs> and Angela Merkel of Germany as doing two people who seemed to know what they were doing. They would probably have done a much better job than Donald Trump. But the reason why we reach back to the 19th century was, and we chose these two figures of William Gladstone, who was the four times prime minister in Britain, the kind of great liberal reformer, and Abraham Lincoln from America, from America was that, that was a time where people thought that you could make government much better, you could serve the people, especially the poor, but at the same time, you could make it smaller and more efficient. And so what we do is we invent this mythical creature, Bill Lincoln, and we put him in the White House and say, what would you do? And, and we set him only one parameter, which by itself is quite interesting. We say you can only use what other countries are already using. So in many ways, it's like going back to your your previous life, Tom, in in, in business. You know, if, if another company is doing something better than you, you copy it or you go out of business yourself. But governments are very bad at that. And so we look around the world and we say, you know, how could America have a better healthcare system? Well, here's the answer. You borrow from Singapore. You borrow actually a bit from Germany. You borrow from places that work. How can America have a better system for doing other things you look around the world and you see 
again and again that the core of it is to simplify the system. In America, there's $1.6 trillion. It's very difficult to even begin to comprehend this. $1.6 trillion of tax exemptions, nearly all of which go to the rich. A much simpler tax system than thought that Bill Lincoln would have would get rid of all those, redirect, redirect the kind of resources of the state away from the rich, which is where most of them go at the moment, towards the poor. And we go through a series of different reforms. And the point about saying, using things which are there at the moment, is that we think that the world could react, that America could wake up, especially prompted by fear of China, and could do something. But that's the reason why we went back to the 19th century, rather than somehow blending Mrs. Merkel with Mrs. Yeah. Mahan. Well, I, I agree with the two of you that obviously the, um, the, uh, the healing, the improvement in, in America is key for the West to get strengthened. <clears throat> Again, I think one of your colleagues in the Financial Times these days wrote, uh, Biden must do America first. The president must concentrate mm -hmm. heavily on, on the job. Uh, uh, and hopefully he will pick up some of the recommendations that you have, uh, that you have made uh, to, uh, to strengthen America again, because without America, uh, the, the, the concept of the West is still uh, not not feasible, and particularly the rivalry with, um, uh, with with China. I think that's that's absolutely true. Now, in Europe, there are a lot of people who who think uh, wonderful. We have Biden uh, back to the olden days. He will reestablish the transatlantic relationship as we liked it. Uh, that means the Americans will largely carry the burden, and mm -hmm. uh, we don't have to do that much in, in my country, in Germany. I think that's a prevailing attitude uh, amongst politicians, whichever party, when it comes to defense, for instance. And there are those who are saying, no, there won't be a way back. Uh, this is not going to happen. So it's going to be a different, a very different game. Europe needs to do more. Uh, Europe needs to wake up, particularly because America isn't as strong as it was before. And inevitably, and that started already under Obama, this is not a Trump phenomenon, uh, the pivoting to Asia, the focus on Asia, and here particularly China, will will force Europe to be more self-reliant and to do more, uh, also in terms of uh, security, policing, uh, what have you, in its neighborhood, than uh, and the Americans used to do in the olden days. Uh, how do you see that? I think that's going back in right. Biden, or or <clears throat> is it? Is I think that's okay? that's absolutely right. Biden's slogan is "Build Back Better." And part of building back better will be building back a bit differently. And I do not think that we'll go back to the old transatlantic arrangements whereby um, America paid all the bills and Europe got all the benefits. I think that, they, that um, as you said, actually the, 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 the pivot towards Asia, the pivot away from Europe began, bef <clears throat> began before Trump. It began with um, it began at least with Obama and the resentment that um, America was having to bear an unfair share of the burden was there for a very long time. So I think that you will see a continued shift towards Asia. You will see continued um, cajoling from Biden of, of, of Europe and particularly Germany to, to pay more for the defense of, of, of Europe. And this is at a time when, you know, Russia is, you know, it's full unpleasantness is being unmasked at a time when China is becoming more aggressive. So we will have to see a much more considered and much more generous uh, attitude towards defence spending uh, than we've seen in the past in Europe. And I also, one of the things to remember about Biden is that he's been in this game for a very long time. You know, he's been on the defence, he's, he's been on the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Senate, I think, for about 30 years. He's been head of that, 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 that committee for... For, for four years, His, uh, he knows a lot about this and he's surrounded by a group of people who are very, very well versed in this whole world. And one of the things about these people is that they're, they're really quite hard headed. Um, people like Tom Donnellan are not gonna be all sort of marshmallows and mushy niceness. They will be quite hard headed toward Europe. They know the details and they will be cajoling. The way that Trump, because he was such a blustering and rather ignorant man, couldn't get round Europe. You know, Europe, Europe felt self-righteous and justified 
um, in its um, digging in by Trump's behavior. You won't be able to get that with Biden. So I think that we, we're going to see you know, building back better will be um, a process of paying more for, from Europe while America disengages itself to some extent, or at least you know, shifts a lot of its attention towards Asia and, and, and China. Mm. Can I just can I just come in and add something there? I th I, th I think that you know the interesting thing about Donald Trump, just on, which sits there, is that you could argue that he did get something right in in seeing China as as a as an adversary more clearly than previous um, presidents have. And it's almost but the, the amazing thing about him is if he got that right, he got the means by which you win these contests completely wrong. You look at the last Cold War. America won that with two things. It won it by being by having allies and bringing them in and building with them. And secondly, it won it by kind of singing a song of freedom, which was more attractive than anything else. Well, the message of America first was a disaster because firstly, it said we don't need allies. So it gave the Europeans an excuse to not do much. Um, and even when they weren't doing much, Trump was insulting them, which wasn't helpful. And then secondly, by saying this is just for America's sake, you gave up the whole rhetoric of liberty, of freedom, of democracy, which does matter. I mean, at different times, we can all point to occasions when, when America <coughs> has been hypocritical, when it's been wrong, but that message resounds. And I think what Biden, one of, I think this is one area where Biden has a fairly easy victory. He can sort of reunite the democracies, including, it should be stressed, the Asian democracies, you know, you've got India, you've got most, most of the countries, India's a slight exception, Japan, South Korea, Singapore, all the Taiwan, all these places that did really well in COVID are all, are all, are all mm. democracies, you pull them mm. in. So that on, that's on Biden, but I think on, on Europe, I mean, Adrian's absolutely right, you, you, Europe to some extent, Trump has been a wonderful excuse for Europe not doing things, Europe not reacting to Brexit. You know, many of the problems with European, with government in America, are also true in Europe. So there are there is a series of issues that I think will become much more naked now. Yeah. Well, uh, John, uh, you mentioned Asia. Quick, quick question: uh, Do you think there is a is a quick way back to the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership? That was the one treaty that uh, Trump tore apart on day one of his uh, presidency, stupidly. I mean, the result is that the Chinese and 14 other Asian countries, I think it was uh, concluded that the yeah, regional yeah. Yeah. comprehensive agreement a couple of, couple of months ago, and that included former US allies, or ho hopefully still US allies, like Japan and, and Korea. So huge damage, but can that be repaired? <laughs> I think I think it can be re. I, I mean, I'm interested in what Adrian thinks on this, but I think it can be re. I think it can be repaired. I don't think it can be precisely sold to the American people in exactly the same way. It got, it got the the reputation got muddied. But if you begin to build it, as I said earlier, as much around democracy as trade, um, mm. because I think that the the one thing which is interesting and which comes through the sort of especially in the in, in you know the, the, our book is about the history of government. But you know, one thing which comes through is that politics changes government changes when people detect an adversary um you know to give to give you an example you go back a hundred years ago um there was a revolution in government which invented the welfare state changed really the way that people did it um now when people look back at that they tend to um look at countries like britain and france and think they did that because a group of liberal people got concerned about the poor you look closer, and that's not true. The main reason why Britain began to move in that direction was out of terror of a new rising Germany. They thought they needed a better, um, they needed better educated people to have a better fighting force and so on. And you found people like Winston Churchill, very conservative people, suddenly backing the idea of state education and much bigger pensions, all that sort of stuff, all the things in order to have a better and that, and that was based on adversarial politics, obviously not always a great thing, but it does spur change. And I think when it comes to selling things like the partnership, if Biden can say, look, this is, this is the way for America to remain a power in the Pacific, this is the way in which we must take this forward, then I think that becomes, if he sells it under the guise of national security rather than just on the guise of trade, then I think that is possible, yes. But I think it will need slightly middling with. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to add a little bit to what John was saying there. 
um, because I think it's 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 um, Tom is absolutely right to say do America first that Biden has to address the problems of the United States before he can really rebuild a lot of these alliances because you know Trump wasn't just an aberration Trump was a response to a demand and the demand was from a large number of American people who felt that America, in its enthusiasm for global free trade, in its enthusiasm for playing the world policeman, under, particularly under George W. Bush, had neglected large numbers of people, particularly in the, in, in the heartland. And those people felt that their living standard uh, standards had stagnated uh, because of free trade, uh, globalization, and they felt that they, their children had gone off to fight wars in um, the, the, in the Middle East uh, and had been killed in those wars, um, and it wasn't really any of their business. You know what were they doing policing these parts of the world? And so th that 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 feeling is very strong in the United States, uh, and will I think produce uh, another similar Trump phenomenon if if those feelings aren't addressed. So Biden really has to deal with the the woes of the blue collar worker. He has to deal with the idea that America is bearing disproportionate in fact in some cases all of the the burden of being a global policeman so he has to provide something for for, for those those people in order that they will be engaged in, in, in global free trade and, and, and global police role and the problem with doing that is that um, the Democrats um, instinctively like government they think the government is the solution um, but they also like the trade unions, they like the teachers unions, they like the police unions, they like all of the interest groups that cluster around government. And so they, they, they're not really very, very good at reforming governments, at, at making government the servants of the people rather than the servants of interest groups. On the other hand, the, the Republicans who, who still have a very powerful position in, in Congress have bought into an ideology which says that the only thing that matters is the market. Um, that governments are in, innately parasitical, that the only thing to do with taxes is to lower them. So you need to have a situation in which you persuade the, um, the Republicans that government matters, that government can solve collective problems, that America will only be able to stand tall in the world as it once did if it has a better educated, healthier, um, more contented population. Um, but also sell to, sell to the to the Democrats the idea that that it's absolutely insane to to have a teaching system that's completely um, subservient to the to the interests of the teaching union. So you need an intellectual revolution, and that, at the heart of that intellectual revolution is thinking again uh, about government. Um, so we have to go right the way back to the you know the pre Reagan period um, and start you know really saying that government can be can be good. But um, the government is indeed invaluable, but only if it's if, if it's not captured by all these vested interests that cluster around it. Mm -hmm. So it is right, uh, <clears throat> gentlemen, that uh, before America can regain the respect that it had around the world or for most parts of the world some some years ago, it uh, Biden has to has to tackle his domestic agenda and uh, yeah. make America strong again from. From uh, from in, uh, from inside, because um, I mean, uh, if, if you look at the results, almost 74, 70, 75 million people voted for Trump after oh. such incredible <laughs> four years <laughs> of President yeah. Trump. So populism, protectionism, is as we speak still raging in America. Yes. I mean, uh, Biden can't ignore it. This is why I think our our friend Gideon Raffman wrote this morning a piece. Which he, where he's saying uh, that I think um, he, was, he was saying basically, uh, therefore, it's unlikely that uh, the Americans will be able to conclude new trade deals uh, anytime soon before Biden has a strong basis for that, uh, uh, cheap for that uh, domestically. I think the only, the only thing is, I said, the only, I, I, I agree with the basic idea, with, I agree with what you said. A slightly more query Gideon's big point is that I, 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 it's definitely true. America's status in the world, its ability to lecture people, has been undermined by Trump, certainly. So they, America can now say we, we've shed Trump. But the problem is the rest of the world has seen what happened during COVID. 
and by any measure you know the, the failure there was massive you've seen what happened in washington it, it's become much it's become much easier for other people to say that america doesn't matter i do think that some bits of it um that, that biden can fix quite quickly and indeed actually having some kind of foreign policy success um, doesn't necessarily get in with get in the way of his um, um, economic message at home. It probably bolsters it a bit. So I think there's more there's more room for him to do things. I mean, again, just simply by not being Trump, um, he has the ability to win some things mm. and get some mm. things underway. Um, yeah. So I think that's, that there is that point. I do I do think that you know the the underlying point, and this this is a really serious one, which goes deeper I think than just you know whether. There's a danger when you talk about government that you think, does it mean that you need to decide, decide, design the European Commission with slightly fewer directorates? Or do we need to add another new department in Berlin to this or, you know, make Britain more regional? It can also have very technocratic. But underneath it, you know, we saw with COVID, government was the difference between living and dying. And much more than that, you look around the world. And a lot of people we think are drawing the wrong lesson. And the lesson is that, or just because China, as I said, and you know, we have to be very straightforward about it, China did nearly 50 times better than America, even if you inflate their statistics by 10. Um, you know, the, the chi China by any measure did massively better than America. And there is a sort of false positive out there. And the false positive is that autocracy is better than democracy. And when you actually look at the countries that have done well with COVID, virtually all of them are democracies. You know, China is the exception. If you, do, you wouldn't have wanted to get um, COVID in any of the stands. You wouldn't want to get COVID in Iran. You certainly wouldn't want to get COVID in North Korea. The only the one bit which is very obvious that the false positive is to look at China doing better than America and think that. So the democracies have still got a lot of sort of power behind them. But especially in the West, if we don't look at different ways to make schools better, mm. I mean, in many ways, it's it's astounding. You look, you think back to your previous career. If you, you know, it has been obvious for twenty years that Singapore is doing something clever when it comes to schools, education, all these, and health, and yet we have wholly failed to copy them. They, they, mm. and, and mm. it is a different model. They, they are building government that is smaller than us, more efficient. And a lot of it does, is to do with how they lure people in. They pay people at the top much more. Mm. You get paid a million dollars to run bits of the Singapore Internet Service. Yeah, yeah. You would never get to pay that in any part of the European. Uh, if you, yeah, if you yeah. offered a civil servant a million dollars in Germany, there would be a complete panic. But as yeah. a result, you end up with much better people in it. And, yeah. you end up with, and the other side of it is they sack bad people. If you were to go to German universities, or for that matter, any other, and, and, and look for bad professors, um, you know the Singaporeans don't—they don't tolerate that at school. They haven't yeah, been quite yeah. successful at universities yet. But in terms of, you know, they have been top. They have been top of the school rankings for years, and yet the bigger Western countries haven't copied them. Some of the Nordics yeah. have begun to copy some of the things, but we have to copy that. The same with health. The same with these other things. And the Chinese are copying them. And they're gaining from that. So it's almost like we, in your old career, if you've sat and watched Boeing making immensely right, better right. planes, you might have been tempted to copy them every now and again. Obviously, that yeah. never happened. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure, <laughs> sure we do. <laughs> well, I mean, very interesting point you're making on, on Singapore. Just incidentally, I, I, wrote an inter I read an interview this morning um, of uh, uh, Lord Hammond, Phil Hammond. Uh, about the situation, Brexit, etc., and I would like to spend a few moments of that. That's, that's closer to home, but but very uh, discomforting, I would say, <clears throat> and, and in a sense frustrating. But we are where we are. But he was asked whether uh, he was in favor of making uh, the UK uh, Singapore, and of course he said, of course not Singapore. So so even he was uh, defensive about it. But, but John, I think it was basically two points that people were saying. Singapore is not a democracy, it's more an autocracy or, well, kind of something in between. And then it's only a tiny, tiny city, so we cannot copy it. But, but you're absolutely right. It's uh, the Chinese with uh, the biggest, most populous country in the world is, 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 is copying what they think is worth copying from Singapore. So it's, uh, well, in the West, we have been unable to, to do that. Um, 
there's there's one point that you we just mentioned Singapore. You know, they 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 pay they pay very competitive salaries so that you can can really make a choice. Go do I go to a big corporate, become chief operating officer, or whatever, or do I go into the government of Singapore and earn almost the same same amount yeah. of uh, same amount of money? When I look at your bill. Um, just said, almost said Bill Clinton, Bill Lincoln, yes. Bill Lincoln. Um, aren't you trying to uh, construe a, a person here, a politician that is almost superhuman? I mean, we don't have superhuman uh, uh, politicians. In other words, are you expecting too much of the reigning political class that we that we have in the West, or do you seriously think we can? Um, improve it because we have politicians in almost all Western democracies now who've never done anything else than earning their living in politics rather than in the real economy, in the finance sector, in the industrial sector or what, or what, or what, or what have you. Um, isn't, isn't that one of the basic problems of the uh, political elite we have uh, today in, in the Western countries? Tom, I'm very attracted to your pessimism because I naturally sympathize with it. But I do think it's important to, to, to remember that although the world is very difficult to change, um, and although you can get bogged down very easily in any overambitious reform program, that the world does change. There have been periods when you've had dramatic shifts in political regimes. We had that in the late, uh, in Britain in the, and the United States in the 1970s and early 1980s, when you had a, a fundamental change in the assumptions about what makes for good government. Um, and um, I think that it was the case that the, the policies of the 1970s couldn't go on, that we had entered a world of stagflation, of overpowerful interest groups, of, uh, of a government that is overreaching, and that the adjustments that Thatcher and Reagan make made were were correct and incredibly far reaching and i think that we have we have reached the same state now that the nature of government its inability to learn its inflexibility um its uh, encrustment with vested interests and its failure to recognize the extreme nature of the threat that comes from china uh, means that we can't go on in the same way um so I do think that we need to have a revolution um, in government. And that revolution in government is difficult, but it's not impossible. Partly, as John, uh, as John has emphasized, that in the past you've had revolutions in government when you have competition, you have an alternative uh, power grouping that is threatening your, 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 your position. We have the competition. You have a revolution in government when you have a set of ideas about how to improve it. We do have, I think, a set of ideas scattered around the world, you know, Singapore being a prime example of that. Um, and you have a revolution when you have a new technology that comes along. In the middle of the 19th century, we had all of those things in place. Um, and as a result of that, we got the rise of the, the meritocracy, open competition, um, a state that looked after the, you know, so, some of the basic things like education and sanitation, which it hadn't done before. And I think we do have that in place at the, at the moment. The only thing that, um, that will make that happen is agitation by people like you, people like us, saying we need, uh, need to go ahead. But it's possible. It's not impossible, you know, in, in the way that it probably was in the 90s because we were doing... We were doing so well, and I think the reason we keep banging on about Singapore in this in this book um, is partly because the the proof is there in the in, mm. in, in mm. being that Singapore is obviously doing very well. But Singapore has challenged a number of the fundamental assumptions of, of of the state. We argue in this book that the West pulled ahead of the rest of the world from the 16th century onwards because it kept inventing and reinventing the state. It's invented this with Hobbes and the idea of the nation state in the six, in the 17th century. It's invented it again with the, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the idea of individual rights. Um, it's invented again with the rise of the welfare state with Bismarck and Lord George uh, and the rest. And then we're saying we have something like that going on again. But where the really interesting ideas are coming from is, is Singapore particularly Lee Kuan Yew's very fertile brain. Mm -hmm. He says that we need more meritocracy 
and less well it is be less democracy but less but, but but less conceding to interest groups they said we need uh, an austere welfare state rather than what he called the all you can eat buffet of the west and he said that you need a role for the state in terms of pushing industry up the value chain in, in his view it needs to be active and interventionist so he says in here the in the west the state is a sort of feather bed there it's a sort of goad pushing you to be to be more competitive this is the first time we've had a real you know a set of ideas from the state not coming from the from the west and it's behoves behoves us to look at them and see what we can learn from them um, China is certainly doing that. I think we can learn a lot about, about meritocracy, about uh, you know, some ways more active uh, industrial policy, and also being much more austere in the way that we deliver welfare. Yeah, welfare yeah. benefit. I think you're absolutely you're, you're both absolutely right to point at, at Singapore, and I would suggest to DLD or others that, that this is a topic that we should uh, we should uh, more elaborate on in the future because the time might be right now for, for people to listen um, uh, to, uh, to an example by Singapore. Normally we are, we are all talking about uh, examples only from the West, but, but Singapore is in, incredibly successful. And after the pandemic where people have experienced more, let me say, authoritarianism in the West as well, uh, less liberalism with all the, you know, the, the, the state is upon us and tells us what to do and how hard to move from our home and how which mask to wear etc etc not necessarily a good thing but people might get more used to that kind of um, you know government uh, control which is not yet chinese control but it's much closer to the singaporean model but but gentlemen um i'm not sure how long we we still have but we must talk about um not brexit i mean we've done that for four or five years my goodness uh, and I think amongst the three of us, we, we all readily agree that it wasn't a good idea and that both sides, the EU and the UK, are to blame for, uh, for that, that it happened and for the result. But, but, you know, applying Adrian's optimism to the uh, UK-EU situation, how do you see this relationship uh, going forward? Uh, must it deteriorate before it it gets better, and uh, how do you see the long-term uh, game between the two playing out? And, and maybe from a British perspective also, uh, it's not like the EU is perfect, it it's absolutely isn't. It is still in a crisis, it is still fragile, uh, it, it, there's still a chance it might fall apart, or at least some countries chip away. Um, what's your perspective on EU, Britain, and the EU uh, development in the future. I'll, I'll let I'll, I'll let Adrian answer most of this because this is this is his bread yeah. and butter of the day job. But I, I just say one thing is I, I I rather my hunch at the moment would be that what you said at the beginning is I think it is likely to get worse before it gets better. I think I think at the moment it feels that way. You you look mm. at what's been happening, for instance, on the City of London and things like that, where people I think. On both sides, the level to which that does not seem to be, um, the, 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 on the one hand, um, the, the British who've been held, he, hiding their heads in the sand about what Brexit actually meant for the City of London and being slightly noticing the number of trading that's now going to Europe. On the other hand, the Europeans not rushing <laughs> to, uh, to to come up with new rules which allow it to stay that way. Um, the only bit I would say that's an obvious example also of why in the end um, it will come back because I don't. I don't think. I think the main gainer from the current kind of standoff is America. I mean, the people we talk to, they're not. They're, some, they're transferring a few people out of London, but not to any one centre. They're spreading mm -hmm. it around between different places. So London's still the preeminent place in Europe. But secondly, the main thing they're doing is they're keeping people in America. So mm -hmm. that Europe is not gaining from this. Anyway, Adrian will give you. Adrian will probably disagree with me intensely. No, no, I, I, <laughs> I, much as I'd like to disagree with you, I'm not going to disagree with you about that. But I think at the moment, the British government and the Tory Party in particular is feeling very good about Brexit. Um, it's feeling very good about Brexit because the the rollout of the vaccine in this country is going extremely well. We've vaccinated more than four million people. Uh, we're probably second to Israel in terms of how rapidly we're vaccinating the population. 
And there's a sort of sense on in the Conservative Party, but also my more widespread, that that is somehow vindicates our decision to leave Europe because Europe has not done particularly well in rolling out the vaccine or in purchasing the vaccine in, in, in the first place, that the European Commission has not distinguished itself, that France, which is our eternal enemy, is doing particularly badly. So that proves that we were right to get rid of all, of all of this sort of stuff. And secondly, you have a peculiar politics of Brexit because of the pandemic, which is that everything that goes wrong with our, at our ports can be blamed on the COVID. I heard a minister of on the radio this morning say, well, if there are queues, it's because of COVID testing. And everything that goes right or seems to be going right can be uh, ascribed to, to Brexit. <laughs> so I think, you know, at the moment, it's, it's going well for them. I think in the long term, um, obviously, the problems with leaving the EU, the problems with, um, with make, increasing the friction of trade will accumulate. I think it will obviously um, lower our long-term growth rate. But it's very hard for people to see the links between that uh, and Brexit. So I think that the government will not be destroyed by this. And also, I think the opposition... Has uh, over and over again has has lost the argument by 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 indulging in too much catastrophe. You know, we were constantly being told, that, you know, Project Fear, Project Doom, that if we left the EU with a bare bones deal, there would be you know airplanes not flying and things like that. Well, airplanes sometimes aren't flying now, but we can say that that's all all COVID. So, so it, it is a sort of for, for for Boris Johnson, I know, a figure of fun in in Germany, but 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 politically, you know, quite strong here now. Um, because of the combination of, of getting Brexit done, which was the biggest split in the Conservative Party for 30 years, and a successful rollout of the vaccine. Uh, if I may add just a footnote about Singapore, I think what, one of the interesting things is we, we um, in some ways, left the European Union because of the promise of being Singapore on Thames, um, which at least I think five members of the current cabinet wrote a a pamphlet which used this phrase Singapore on Thames. We wanted to be Singapore. I don't think we understood what Singapore is because we saw it as, you know, Hong Kong as a very free trade port almost, which it certainly isn't. But they said we'd have Singapore on Thames, which meant low, less regulation, which meant uh, free ports and all of that sort of stuff, which meant uh, uh, engaging with the whole world um, in free trade. But most people who voted for Brexit voted for the opposite of all of those things. They didn't want to live in Singapore. They wanted to live in a world with more intervention, more protectionism, a bigger state, and certainly not more competition. And what we're moving towards, I think, is not Singapore on Thames. The government is being pulled by, by, by its voters towards more of um, an interventionist policy, more of a protectionist policy, um, so bigger more, state. More European. <laughs> More European, so more European. So we're actually going back to the 1970s in some ways, um, or to a more European set of policies. Um, so, think, you know, the, the last thing we're doing is becoming Singapore on Thames. We're, be, we're becoming London on Thames, 1970s style, almost spending a lot of money, um, feather bedding a lot of people, um, and generally becoming less competitive. <laughs> well, uh, gentlemen. Um... Britain is out of the EU, but but uh, you are, you are still entitled to comment on the state of EU or what you what you would recommend. I mean, uh, your figure of um, Bill Lincoln, maybe we need a Conrad de Gaulle or something like that in uh, in, in in Europe. But uh, what, what do you think? Uh, and maybe also as part of the reflection or part of the lessons learned from the um, from the Brexit. Uh, what does Europe need to change or do better in order to in order to to be to be relevant uh, even in the future? I'm not even dreaming of Europe really moving towards a a, a more unified uh, entity, which I think we need at least in foreign policy, defense, and some some other areas to be able to compete with the the great powers of tomorrow. Uh, what is your what, what what would be your action plan for Conrad de Gaulle? Well, I think I, I, you you mentioned you began with the European Union. Strangely, um, coming from a British point of view, I've always thought that the, Euro, the European Union's or the eurozone's problem or the core problem is one of integration. 
And it, it, it's very difficult to see how a currency union can survive without some kind of fiscal union and some kind of banking union. And the amazing thing is, despite everything the Eurozone has been through, it really hasn't moved in either direction. The banking union is still some way off. Your banks scattered all the way across the place. And on the on, and on the um, on the issue of fiscal union, I know there was a little kind of COVID has caused a slight movement on that, but it's still some way from it. And I think that will always cause the European Union problems, and that would be the main thing. That, that in, and in the end, I think a lot of that requires convincing um, um, convincing Germany, which is part of it. Um, and that's from a British point of view, as someone who doesn't generally like big government. But in that particular thing, I don't think there's a way around it. On the second issue, I think there's a huge number of things that we suggest that Bill Lincoln could do in America. Um, the healthcare may be a particularly American thing, but there's, there, are, there are issues there where Europe can learn from it. Schools and paying civil servants and things like that, Europe can mm. certainly mm. learn from that. I think one thing that we do stress in the book is we talk about the need for the elites to be re-engaged in government. And we look at two particular ways of that, but one of them is, is the issue of national service. I know France has looked at, I should stress, this would be non-military national service. At the moment, you have far too many, I think, university students around Europe who are growing up with no real ties to either the state. And when I say, when I say university, I mean prosperous young, with not enough ties to either the countries where they live, nor for that matter, to the other people who are their age. And one of the beauties about saying that people might spend a year or 18 months when they're I don't know, 23, 24, doing a project for the state is that you would then begin to bring clever young people into the state, but you would also get the kind of social cohesion. And you, you do need some degree of belief in Europe, because um, mm. otherwise I think, um, I think we could end up with a system where Europe just gradually um, disintegrates again. And that's mm. what worries me. Mm -hmm. Very, very good point. The, the national, the national service. I personally think, John, it should be both. It should be <clears throat> people should have an option between military and yes, exactly, and, totally. You and, should and social yeah. and social service. I should, yeah. I should have explained. I, I, I didn't mean compulsory military yeah. service. Yeah, yeah. Compulsory yeah. military yeah. service would have been very good for Adrian, but otherwise, I, I have no, no aims. Of it. <laughs> Are you teasing him? <laughs> okay, gentlemen. I look at the at the watch here. I promise we come back to uh, to China. Um, I read recently that um, <clears throat> because China seems to be the overriding the overriding challenge for the Americans uh, for the West, uh, they copied Singapore at least what they could copy with their still communist system in, in place and doing well with that. Um, and uh, on the other hand, I mean, we have to admit that the Chinese have been contributing immensely to global, uh, global wealth and well-being, not only in their own country, but throughout the world. Where would the German car industry be that, that partially makes 40% or more of its profits in China these days uh, without the Chinese, Chinese market and many other industries? And I speak for the plane makers as well, Airbus, Boeing, uh, exporting 20, 25% of the annual production uh, to uh, to China, so, so let's let's not see the China challenge as a, as a, as a one-sided uh, negative thing. But I read uh, I read recently that uh, by the end of 2019, about 130 countries out of 190 existing countries in the world had more trade with China already uh, when with the with the U.S. Now, then, if you look at the projection of economic growth, uh, China seven to eight percent this year, uh, the U.S. Uh, three three point five percent, perhaps. Um, the question uh, or the, the thesis I would bring forward is that maybe the U.S.-China great power competition uh, is already over. Um, uh, the question is, has China already won? Now, I mean. Uh, you blame me rightly probably on my teutonic pessimism and here it is again the teutonic <laughs> pessimism and uh, i would like to give you a chance to to tell me why you believe that it isn't over that this competition uh, can be won that it uh, hopefully is a is a non-military non-violent competition and that uh, the world at large can can gain from that if you well, if you wanted adrian the us the us is 25 percent of the global economy 
um, it dominates an enormous proportion of the industries of the future from um, you know, electric cars, driverless cars, um, to pharm pharmaceuticals, to you know, almost everything internet related. Uh, and America has got an incredible record of self reinvention um, in the past. You know, whenever it looks as though the American uh, system is collapsing for one reason or another, it's reinvented itself. It reinvented itself when it looked as though it was becoming a, a plutocracy. It reinvented itself with uh, Teddy Roosevelt and the progressives in the early 20th century. You know, it had the worst depression in the in the capitalist world, and then came back. Um, in the 1940s and 50s as, as the center of global wealth and manufacturing in particular. Um, in the 1970s, it was hit by stagflation and then came back in the, roared back in the 1980s with an extraordinary set of innovations in, in finance and um, uh, again, the computer economy. So it has a capacity to reinvent itself, um, which I think is unequaled in the world, which is to do with this rather anarchic structure and its emphasis on freedom and individualism and all of that sort of thing. Uh, and China uh, doesn't have that. If it, if it goes wrong, it doesn't have a, an automatic sort of system of self-correction. It has an aging population. Um, and we, we must remember that, 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 that Xi has now declared himself president for as long as he wants to be, and as we know, you know, when you have somebody who doesn't have to re retire, um, as they get older, they'll cling on to power, they'll surround themselves with cronies as they lose their uh, mental and physical capacities, they won't, they won't disappear. So that is a, a massive problem that China has to con confront in the future. You know, the one thing I thought it had done really well is to solve the big problem of autocracies, which is change the guard every 10 years or so. Now it's got rid of that, that safety valve. Um, so I wouldn't say that the future of the world necessarily belongs to China, but it might well do so. And America's problem, I think, is so introspective that it doesn't really know that it's it's losing its, its global preeminence in in so many so many areas. You know that it, everything's Trump's fault or everything's Biden's fault. Uh, they don't look at the rest of the world. So so you know it's it's um, they're capable of, of self correction, but it needs really good leadership to make sure that that happens. John, John, before can you, I, can I add, can I, can I add one very? Sorry, can I, can I just before you before you start? I, I completely uh, ignored the chat here. Unfortunately, we <coughs> we uh, touched on most of the questions where we have. There's, there's one in this context. So somebody asking, uh, we've we've all seen the rise of Japan in the 1980s, and everybody was afraid of the seemingly unbeatable. Uh, Japanese and the Japanese economy, uh, then we saw them fall and, and stumble, or at least stagnate. Could, could something like that happen to China, or is it just not comparable? John? I, I think it is different. I, do, I, I think there is, I think there is, um, I think the level, I mean, from an American point of view, Japan was an industrial challenge. Um, it, was, it, it was not a kind of political um, it was not a political challenge that, that China is, and it does not have the same winds behind it. I was in America during the time when the you know when the when the, the, the Japan was being feared in this way, and even then it felt. I, I was in Los Angeles again the same time as the Rodney King riots, but when when the the Japanese companies were spending a lot of money in Hollywood without seeming to know what they were doing, and they they had a they they had a particular thing that they were good at. I think the thing which is similar. Is you you know you have to ask about demography in China that, that Adrian brought up. I think the other very big thing is that you know we shouldn't. The, it, the reason why we call it a wake up call is because the power is still on one side of the equation. I think even the Chinese know this. If you take the democracies, you you can argue whether America is more powerful than China. Most people would say Amer America is more powerful than China. You can argue whether Europe is weaker than China, and quite a lot of people would say, yes, it is. But the one thing which I think is unanswerable is if you take Europe and America together, they are economic, on every available level, they are massively more powerful than China. So if the West gets, the West does two things. One, it unites again, and then secondly, it reforms its government, <coughs> then it is in a very powerful place. And that is before you even begin to bring in the democracies of Asia. So it is not. If I, I, uh, <laughs> your pessimism, you're right to you're right to attack us from the pessimistic ground because it is 
you know, the, the, and it's quite interesting that you're doing that because I think that the level, to, when we first put the book out, people said, well, China isn't, it, it can't be that good. And then gradually they've begun to realize how much better China has done with the virus yeah. than America has. So it's, it is, it's absolutely the right question to ask. But it, you know, it, if you look at, if you, if you had all the cards, you'd rather be on the table, you'd rather be in the West position than China. And you also have one other weakness in China, is every single society in Asia that has got richer has also got more democratic. And, and, and I should really stress, we met, you know, we can argue whether Singapore is democratic or not. You, you, the, the simplest way to compare good and bad government is to line up New York, London and Seoul, the capital of South Korea, and I haven't checked the numbers recently, but the last time I looked, uh, New York had lost 25,000 people to COVID. London lost 6,000 and Seoul had lost about 60. Mm -hmm. And the point about this is that Seoul is a, fun, a, a massively democratic place. It's got some of the world's biggest nightclubs. It's got the home of K-pop, which I'm sure you listen to, Tom. Yeah. It's the place which gave us Parasite, which won the Oscar last week, last year. <laughs> Yep. Seoul is not, there is no way, people can try and pretend that Singapore is something to do with autocracy. Korea is not. And so they have simply run this thing better. And we can, you know, it, it's not difficult to make Western government yeah. better. Yeah. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, I'm afraid we are, we are running already over time. Uh, I think we have to conclude here, even though we are still in the warm-up phase somehow. On this, uh, but it's a good conclusion on this positive note of uh, both of you. Thank you very, very much for the pleasure of having that chat. Chat, it's a privilege, and hopefully we'll see a, we'll see a second edition of the book uh, soon, Adrian and, and and John, and and maybe even a book that says this time the wake up call worked. That would be even, <laughs> that would be even uh, preferable. So thank you very much, and back to uh, Sheffy. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was such an inspiring, provoking um, conversation. I, I loved your remark, Adrian, that we have to revolutionize governments. We have to. We have to reunite and reinvent Europe. And we have to look, of course, we have to look to Singapore. And Tom's, your, your remark, we already booked the hotel, the conference set, end of May, we are in Singapore. And I invite you and encourage you to do our, to do the second edition of our conversation in Singapore. Oh yeah, we'd love to do that. I think Absolutely we do, all should, should uh, not you, you are the role models, but the DLD community, we should be much more engaged, much more motivated to act and, and learn and be more educated as you are. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really blown away about your insights, about your language, about your humor, about your appearance. Thank you for this. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Steffi. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. 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 Bye.